Was the UK right to vote for a ceasefire in Gaza? Is £100,000 a huge salary? And is being Prime Minister an impossible job? This is Politics Live. Joining me, Conservative MP Sir Connor Burns, Labour Party Chair Annalise Dodds, Liberal Democrat Deputy Leader Daisy Cooper and the political historian, author and head of Epsom College, Sir Anthony Selden. On today's programme. Will those in favour of the draft resolution please their, raise their hand? The UN Security Council votes for a ceasefire in Gaza. There can be no justification for war crimes crimes against humanity and genocide. This is a travesty and I'm disgusted. Farmers descend on Westminster. Are they being undercut by cheap imported food? What most people would consider is a very high salary. Uh, when you have house prices around £670,000, you're paying for childcare, it doesn't go as far as you think. The Chancellor says £100,000 is not a huge salary for some of his constituents. Is he right? Hasta la vista, baby! <laughs> I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. I stand here before you, ready to lead our country into the future. And we're on the third Prime Minister since the last general election. Is it an impossible job? Let's start with the UN Security Council. You can see the BBC News headline uh, passing a resolution calling for a Gaza ceasefire. Uh, the resolution called for it to happen immediately. It was passed last night. Crucial uh, to it being passed was the fact that the United States abstained, which allowed the resolution to pass. Now, the UK voted in favour of the immediate ceasefire. And, of course, you saw there in the headlines, it's prompted anger from Israel. My opening question to the panel, starting uh, with you, Connor, was it right that a UN resolution was passed last night now calling for an immediate ceasefire? Well, look, I think the first thing to say is that the US only abstained because there wasn't reference in the resolution to the terrorist attacks by Hamas on Israel on September the 7th. But I think broadly it was right. I think what we are seeing now playing out is a humanitarian catastrophe. And we have now been consistent in saying that there needs to be a ceasefire to allow that aid to reach the population that are reaching famine levels of deprivation and lack of access to water, to food and to electricity. So, yes, I do think it was right that the United Kingdom sided with a very broad international coalition to say that that ceasefire should happen to allow that aid to get to those poor people. We're seeing pictures here of the devastation in Rafa, in the south of the Gaza Strip, on the border uh, with Egypt. Um, and obviously attempts at some sort of negotiation have failed up until now between Hamas and the Israeli government. Um, I mean, Connor says something's changed. Um, it's got even more perilous uh, for people in Gaza because the UK abstained on three earlier ceasefire resolutions. Um, the Labour Party has struggled uh, with the language around calling for an immediate ceasefire or a sustainable ceasefire, but do you think it's right now that the United Nations has now passed this resolution? Well, Labour did call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, and in fact, Parliament voted for that. That was slightly lost in, unfortunately, some of the kind of political ramifications that went on following that vote. But we thought it was very important that Parliament sent out that clear message because the situation is desperate, as Connor set out. Unfortunately, we see now what are developing famine conditions. We see an appalling humanitarian catastrophe. And it's right that now, we would have liked to have seen this happening earlier, but that now the UK government is supporting those international calls for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. I mean, was it a bit slow here in the UK Parliament, never mind at the United Nations, obviously because the United States have moved um, their position? Um, what's your opinion? 
Well, Liberal Democrats have been calling for an immediate bilateral ceasefire since November, and we were calling on the government to change its voting position at the Security Council since December. So I do think it has taken longer than it should have done. Um, but now that we've got this resolution, which is a good thing, I think we're all very eager to hear what the government is going to do to make it a reality. The fact is that we have hostages, hostages now in their fifth, uh, going to their fifth month um, of being captive. We've got an absolute catastrophe, as others have said, um, happening in Gaza. But what's critical is that this isn't just a temporary, uh, temporary ceasefire. It has to be turned mm. into a lasting peace so we can create the political space to discuss a route to achieving a two-state solution. Andy, did you welcome the UN resolution being passed? Absolutely. I, I think history will say that it should have come a lot earlier. I mean, 15 days at the moment, that is uh, the obligation for Israel to stop. But there are some Tory MPs, colleagues of yours, um, Connor, who aren't happy. They challenged, actually, uh, the Foreign Secretary, uh, David Cameron, over the ceasefire vote. What would you say to them, including Theresa Villiers? Well, look, I think what is very important to remember in all of this is that Israel's objective of being secure in its borders and free from sustained external attack by a terrorist group, Hamas, is a legitimate aspiration. But what we're talking about now is the humanitarian situation that is evolving in the light of the military action. And I think what we've got to do now is put front and centre those people who are at risk of death through starvation. And we have got to create the conditions that allows that aid to get to those people who desperately, desperately need it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, your book and Prime Ministers uh, later on in the programme. But what did you make of David Cameron coming back into government as Foreign Secretary, a former Prime Minister, of course? So I think it's good uh, when any political party brings back people who have real deep experience. I think we've suffered in the last few years from uh, rapid ministerial churn alongside uh, civil service churn and people coming in and being appointed not because they actually know about the subject, but it's just for political reasons. So to have somebody who spent six years as Prime Minister uh, coming in as Foreign Secretary, which is the weightiest job abroad, uh, in some ways more weighty than the Prime Minister if the Foreign Secretary plays it uh, skillfully, I think is only a good thing. And I think that David Cameron is doing the right thing and uh, being the kind of figure grown up that uh, the country needs. Do you agree with that, Daisy? Someone with experience coming back, like David Cameron, into the role of Foreign Secretary? Well, there's two things I would say. The first is it's deeply frustrating for members of Parliament that we can't actually scrutinise the because Foreign Secretary the because he's mm. in the House of Lords and not in the House of Commons. And that's proven to be very frustrating time and time again. And it was frustrating particularly yesterday when he was briefing the 1922 committee and not briefing Parliament as a whole. But what I would say about David Cameron is his presence just reminds us of a time when there was a cross-party consensus <laughs> amongst all the political parties about our standing in the world, the importance of the um, rule of law, about international law... And I feel, though, that has really fallen apart over the last few years, in particular, under this Conservative government. Connor? Well, look, to the parliamentary accountability mechanisms, he's accountable to the House of Lords. There's a minister in the House of Commons who answers for the Foreign Office. This is not unprecedented. We've had this in governments of all persuasions. I remember Peter Mandelson being uh, the business secretary from the House of Lords. It's not unusual, and Parliament copes with those mechanisms. To Anthony's wider point, I think it is a good thing that people of heft and experience are prepared to come back into government to serve. And actually, without a parliamentary constituency, oh, yeah. he can spend more time overseas. And the interesting thing is, at the top of politics globally, leaders don't change as much as they do in Western democracies. So many of those people that Cameron dealt with when he was prime minister are still in positions in other countries. And those relationships will stand us in good stead. Do you agree his track record was so good you've welcomed him back in as foreign secretary? Well, quite frankly, I think that that experience is only really notable given the fact we've seen so much churn in other positions. I mean, we've had five different prime ministers, seven chancellors, and this has led to complete inconsistency in different areas of policy, including actually around foreign policy as well. You look at the overall attitude of Conservative-led governments towards China, for example, where there's been radical changes over the years. So I think the big question is, why is this viewed as such an earth-shattering change, quite frankly, for Conservative led governments when you had far more con continuity, for yeah. example, under the, the previous Labour government. I, I think that's certainly right. I mean, two prime ministers and two chancellors of the Exchequer. But I think what's unusual about this period of Conservative government, these 14 years, 
is the lack of consistency. It's not just the churn of people, often for political reasons, but it has been the lack of consistency in foreign policy, in economic policy, in social policy. What does the Conservative Party believe? What have been the consistent positions? That's what historians will note. This is not a party political point I'm making. It's just a historic point. And we'll pick that up, uh, as I say, later on in the programme. Because last night, um, the streets of Westminster, if you were out and about, uh, rumbled with the uh, passage of dozens of tractors. As uh, farmers, we can see here, did a go-slow drive past uh, Parliament in protest against recent trade deals that they say are undercutting farmers here. We're joined by one of the organisers of that protest, Liz Webster, a farmer and founder of campaign group Save British Farming. Why are you protesting? Uh, well, we've got three core issues that we're talking about, which is, as you say, the substandard imports and also that these substandard imports can be labelled with a British flag if those products are processed or packaged here. And we're calling for a food plan. Um, right now, with the Agriculture Act, it doesn't mention food, hardly. Um, and uh, we need that to protect and ensure food security and food supply. Um, and the, these are issues um, that are all connected. They're complicated. But we've boiled them down to sort of three, three points, which we know that uh, in Westminster, they know what we're saying. Um, and we, we need to, you know, really start focusing on these issues because our food system has had so many shocks in the last recent years. And with the way the world is going, we really believe that the country's food security is national security. Right. Well, Connor, you're a trade envoy to the, the US um, for regional trade. What do you say to Liz about the fact that they've been rotten trade deals uh, post-Brexit and they're undercutting farmers? Well, the interesting thing about Liz, who's a, a very uh, effective campaigner, although not elected for the Liberal Democrats over a variety of roles over many years, is that she's incapable of seeing, and her campaign and all her tweets are all about the, the threat to UK farming from any trade agreements and not the opportunities to UK farming for very high-end premium produce that we're recognised for overseas in those international markets. As far as the US ones are concerned, we're doing state-level agreements, which are not legally binding agreements and usually don't uh, encompass the agricultural farming aspects at all. But there is a huge appetite, I saw when I was Trade Minister, for British farm produce in international markets. Well, let Liz, well, let Liz come back. Um, uh, rightly pointed out there by Connor that you were a parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Twice. Democrats. Um, but in response to what you just heard there from Connor Burns... Uh, well, first things first, I'm, I'm no longer a member of the Liberal Democrats, so let's put that one to bed. You still um, think Tories are capable of criminal greed and are evil? Um, I, let's, let's focus on what well, I'm here you? to talk about, which is food and farming. It's not, not a party political point. I'm here and I've always been involved in politics because of agriculture. We are farmers. And I'm also a British person and I care about Britain. Uh, the reality is of where we are, there's trade barriers between us and our biggest trade partner. Uh, the, 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 the thought that we would export all of our food that we currently export to Europe is for the birds. It just won't happen. But ultimately, where is your focus on Britain and the British people? We've got millions of people who can't afford to live at the moment. And farmers, and I can tell you now, because we were all together yesterday and we're united on this, we want to feed the British people. And we understand that part of that food system has to be exported. 90% of it goes to Europe. The fact is we can't pick up Britain and put it on the other side of the Atlantic or in the Pacific. This is, you know, the reality of trade is about gravity. We have no but agreement with the United States. We have, we have no trade agreement with the United States that, uh, at all, let alone one that covers agricultural well, and farming products. But you produce. wanted... Be, there's, a, uh, there's a nub of the Conservative Party that, that wants an American trade deal. The American trade deal wipes out British agriculture, and that's well, just a fact. Forgive me, Liz. Well, let Connor well, 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 respond. You, you simply cannot say that a trade agreement, the talks for which have not even begun, would wipe out British agriculture. Well, what about the trade cannot, deals now? You cannot wipe away... What about the current ones, argument, though, ..make an argument that something that has not even been talked about in detail 
would have an outcome uh, that would wipe out British farming. That's an absurd proposition. The, the truth of the matter is this government negotiated a trade deal with Australia which gives them absolute access to our market in 15 years with no quotas and the former DEFRA secretary, George Hughes, has been highly critical of this trade deal and there's no access for British beef to Australia. I mean, this is beyond a betrayal. Um, and, uh, you know, as a British, British patriot, uh, uh, you know, well, the Conservative Party have totally and utterly betrayed no, this is the, the British... This right, is well, let me, before I open it up, this respond is, to that, but respond to that, because we were promised cheaper food and happy farmers, and we don't seem to have either, although many farmers, by of course... Uh, by Brexit. Yes, for Brexit in these post-trade deals, but many farmers did vote for Brexit. But, but here you see is, is again, the, the, the contradiction in the argument that is being advanced here. You cannot say that, on the one hand, you want consumers to have cheaper food in the supermarket and and then say well you don't want any cheaper um, food coming in from abroad now I actually think that the prime I actually think the prime minister has done a very good job I look I was in the rooms no, negotiating many of these things. I think we've nobody done an extremely good job in protecting, hang on, Liz, hang protecting on. the best of British agriculture in the deals that we've done. The extremely long, 15 years, the extremely long transition period, giving everyone a time to adopt to adapt to new uh, market circumstances, is perfectly reasonable. All right, let me bring the others in and I'll come back to you, uh, Liz. Daisy. Well, look, after Brexit, farmers were promised a land of milk and honey and they've been absolutely sold a pub. So what's happened is the government have got these trade deals with Australia and New Zealand that are undercutting farmers. We hear that day in, day out from farmers. The Conservative government have completely botched the transition from the old payment system to the new uh, payment system and that's been delayed. So farmers have been left in this kind of hiatus somewhere in the middle, unable to uh, produce food. And they've also been starved of the workforce they need to, to grow their seasonal crops. I speak to growers in my my local area the energy costs are really high the fertilizer costs have gone through the roof yeah. farmers can't import so what would you do seeds. so what would you do as liberal democrats you, well, you've ruled out rejoining um uh, the single market the eu single market so what would you do the very first thing that we would do which we have already called for is we would immediately increase the budget for farmers by one billion pounds to improve our food security and protect food standards in this country well farmers need support now uh, liz are the lib dems right to have ruled out rejoining the eu single market that's also not our position. But... For, you know, for us, uh, getting back as close to Europe as possible is a priority. And it's a priority. I mean, anyone that eats and relies on food, it's a priority. Um, and uh, we are in Europe, as I said, and gravity means we need to work with the continent next door to us in, in, to ensure our food supply. Um, so the closer the, and quicker that we can do that, the better. And the Labour Party have agreed a veterinary agreement, and that is the beginning in the right in, in the right direction. But there needs to be a sense of urgency. This is urgent. Right. Um, and when we we have a lot of confused messaging, uh, you know, about sort of wanting to trade with the rest of the world, the reality is that as soon as you, we've come out of Europe, we don't have the protection of the single market. So we would be better off in the single market without it we were better off in the single market we would be better out in the single market as to whether we can get in the single market with you know just by asking who knows because that's a, that's not our right, gift is it that comes from the european union anthony but so just, I, just I, to go back to I, connor's point well i'll come back to that in just a minute let me bring the others in anthony so i'd just like to ask i just want to understand here how is britain better off british consumers of food and farmers better off? Are we better off after Brexit? Can I just go around, just so I can understand, are we better off because of Brexit, our food security, food supply and farming? Uh, no, we're not. And that's and, why the and, Liberal Democrats have got a roadmap to uh, improve our relationship okay. with the Europe. Well, hang on, though, on, that, yes. hang on that, but not to rejoin. You said that wasn't your position, but it is your position not to rejoin. So we have set out a roadmap to improve our relationship with Europe. That oh. starts with improving the existing trade deals. It in, uh, in, includes uh, rejoining a number of um, EU-wide programmes. And eventually, at some point in the future, mm. right. when it might be possible, we want to rejoin the single market. Anthony, you wanted to ask Annalise Dodds? Well, I'm yes. just trying to understand how, how are we better off? I mean, uh, the, the party, Labour doesn't want to go back into uh, the EU, uh, but how are we better off out of Brexit, specifically uh, with food and our farming industry? Yeah, I mean, of course, we all know around this table that Britain voted to leave. That's unambiguous. That's happened. So Labour is not seeking to rejoin the single market or the customs union. But the issues that rural businesses have raised with me are not actually to do with that overall architecture. They're quite simple things like the lack of a veterinary agreement, for example, the red tape that comes from that. Other issues to do with 
energy costs and so forth. And a government that is worth its salt should be focused on those issues. So you're likely be... to be the government. So how are we better off now with Brexit? Well, that, that decision has been taken, Anthony. It's been taken by the British. But, but Keir Starmer said, we were, Keir Starmer said we were actually better off outside of the European Union in interviews quite recently. Well, we need to be using the situation that we have for the benefit of our people and businesses. And we're not doing that. We've just been talking about trade deals where, unfortunately, we've not seen the UK getting the best out of those trade deals for our farmers. In fact, even Rishi Sunak himself said these were one-sided deals. You know, Daisy set out so, some of those issues so, around, for example, high standards. So we need to change so that. As a historian, I'm keen to understand why would Labour, who didn't support Brexit, imagine it can do better for business and for consumers uh, than the Tories who avidly supported Brexit? Why will you do better in power having not supported it, than the party that did support it, making the wonderful Brexit benefits happen? Well, I'm afraid that the Conservative Party is not making Brexit work. They are not putting the measures into place that are needed. They are actually not stripping away red tape. In fact, they've seen it proliferate, and it's been our farmers and others attempting to export from our country who've been paying the price as a result. And you need to have a government that's pragmatic, that's not internally divided on these issues. That's been another problem with the Conservatives' approach over the last well, few years, that they're all over the place on this. They can't move forward. Well, let's get, let's get, hang on, let's get Connor to a response since he's listened uh, to the responses from both the Liberal Democrats sure. and Labour. Where Annalise is absolutely right is that Brexit is a reality. We voted for yeah. it. That was the decision the British people took. But the criticism you're not we, making it well, work. We can then have a very strong debate about how we use the freedoms that Brexit affords us and whether we've gone far enough or not. And I personally think we could go further. I remember being in, in Chile when I was trade minister and the, my counterpart minister saying, well, of course, you've got the, the tariffs on olive oil to protect, presumably, the UK olive oil producers. He was being sarcastic. The, one of the, the unarguable things about Brexit is that we now control our trade policy for the first time in over 50 years, and we can negotiate bilateral trade agreements where the only thing we have to consider is the United Kingdom's interests and the interests of our negotiating partner. And that is a huge opportunity for the UK. The real challenge that farmers have faced recently are the energy bills and the lack of absence, Connor, uh, access to fertiliser caused yeah. by the problems in Ukraine. Those yeah. are day-to-day -day things that, that any the government figures, would need to that address. But the figures of the trade deals, the amount of trade that has been generated mm. from those trade deals now is still a drop in the ocean compared to the trade we did have, slightly different point to what Liz is saying, to the trade we did have with the EU. So there are two points to that, very briefly. The first point is, and Kemi Badenoch, the International Trade Secretary, has said this in Parliament, that the... the the formula for looking at those needs, looking at again, it's extremely pessimistic and doesn't take into account that many of those areas are going to be the turbocharged areas of future economic growth, while Europe is contracting as a share of global GDP All right. in the years and let decades me go back to, Let me go back to Liz, because you're talking about being undercut and, and possibly accepting lower environmental and food standards. But actually, the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, uh, who reported relatively recently on some of the agreements, including with Australia and New Zealand, concluded it was unlikely that food produced to lower animal welfare standards would be imported into the UK. Do you accept that? Unlikely, that's a good one. Uh, look, CPTPP <laughs> is an absolute nightmare. Right. Uh, the way Explain that what the acronym means. Works. Uh, the, the uh, well, gosh, you've got All right. the right. Anyway, it's the trade for the partnership. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, go on. Um, the, um, the truth of that agreement, that trade block, is that there's no democratic structure and we totally lose control. It's harmonisation of regulations. And we're the only country uh, in Europe who've, uh, who've decided to go into this block. So we've got no weight at all, you know. It's a tug of war, trade is. We're a small country and we're shrinking because our economy is shrinking because of Brexit. Right, so what and are you going to do? Ultimately, ultimately, if we go into CPTPP, we will have to harmonise with their regulations. That means accepting hormone-fed meat. And that means catastrophe for British farming. All right, I mean, Liz Webster. No, well, no, on um, that point, Liz, Liz thank you uh, for means, that. But, Connor, on that point, what do you say? It means 
agreeing to whatever, ministers accountable to the House of Commons... But could it mean that? Enter, it could if ministers agree to that. I think it is vanishingly unlikely that ministers would agree to that and come to the House of Commons, and I don't think the British public have any appetite to oh. buy such produce. And ultimately, the British consumer is the arbiter of what is and isn't acceptable in their supermarkets by their purchasing power. We're going to move on to it. Liz Webster, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a tweet from the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. Uh, we can show it to you now. I spoke to a lady from Godalming, sounds like a joke, about eligibility for the government's childcare offer, which is not available if one parent is earning over £100,000. That's an issue I would really like to sort out after the next election, as I am aware it's not a huge salary in our area if you have a mortgage to pay. Now, following uh, that tweet suggesting that £100,000 isn't a huge salary, Jeremy Hunt actually doubled down on his view in his interview with the BBC on Sunday. Let's have a look. I said that because I was talking to a constituent of mine in Godalming who was mm -hmm. saying that even on what most people would think, and she recognised that is what most people would consider as a very high salary, uh, when you have house prices around £670,000, you're paying for childcare, it doesn't go as far as you think. Is it a huge salary, £100,000 a year, Connor? I can understand how this can easily be misrepresented well, as the can... Chancellor yeah. talking in the most general terms when he was very specifically addressing and replying to a point that his constituent had made to him about the area that he serves in the House of Commons, where I think I heard Jeremy say that the average house price What about in your constituency? Would it, be a would it be a huge salary in Bournemouth? There is no doubt, compared to average earnings, it is a high salary. Yeah, because the, the average earnings... The Chancellor was referring very specifically <laughs> to the, the, the £100,000 uh, cut-off point around eligibility on childcare and whether that needed to be looked at. And All that's right. a debate we can have. I think in many parts of, of the South East particularly, and parts of the South West, certainly in London, there will be people who would would find those comments ones that resonate with them. Well, but, but hang on, Joe, because this is really yeah, essential. This is not the chance to say we must focus everything on those earning around 100000 No, no, I didn't say that. I'm just asking if it's a big salary. ...of the massive increase in the tax-free earnings allowance, the, <laughs> the national insurance reductions. Mm. But all of this, by the way, the biggest challenge in the cost of living stuff to the country is the tax burden that has been caused by the borrowing during the pandemic, the mm. impact of the, the freezing of the tax thresholds by Conservative and, yes, governments, yes. In response to is the current circumstances. Is it a huge salary, Daisy? £100,000 a year? I think it's a very big salary, yes, of course it is. And there are millions of people who don't earn anything like that amount of money. Um, I think what Jeremy Hunt probably couldn't admit was the fact that if people on £100,000 are feeling the pinch because of the mini mm. budget and the increase in mortgages, then what on earth is it like for people on much lower salaries? And I certainly know when I knock on doors in my constituency of St Albans where we have a huge variety in terms of uh, people's incomes, I say to people, you know, how are you experiencing, experiencing the cost of living? And people who are on a good salary, nowhere near 100000 mm. but even on a good salary, they will say, you know what, we are feeling the pinch, we're tightening our belt, but we're the lucky ones and yeah. we're really worried about everybody else who isn't as lucky as us. Right, but if you're on 100000 pounds a year do you not deserve or should you not have access to help with childcare for example well, look, I think that's I mean, the point that Jeremy Hunt is making is he's sort of saying that um, everybody should be entitled to everything. I think what's well, really important no, he is was, that... No, he was referring specifically to higher uh, mortgages, um, and that may well be uh, Conservative government's fault, but higher mortgages and childcare costs. Should you not have access, if you earn £100,000 a year, to those sorts of things like childcare? I think when it comes to access to all kind of public services and care, mm. people who are earning more need to pay more, and people who are not earning as much need to, to have more support. That should be a sort of basic tenet of how we run things. I think what we find at the moment is that people who are on some of the lowest incomes right now mm. can't even afford to put food on their table, to heat their homes, let alone pay for childcare, and that is holding people back from going back to work, and that means we can't get any economic growth. So there it, are huge problems in the way the government is managing the economy right now. Is it a big salary, £100,000 a year? Well, of course it is. It's a huge salary. And I'm sorry, but I think this just demonstrates quite how out of touch the but Conservatives that's, that's have become. That's how you want to characterise no, his reply to a specific not, constituent in a particular well, part let, of let, let her reply and then it's I'll come back. If, if I can finish, as I understand it, the average salary actually in the Chancellor's patch mm -hmm. is something like £42,000. It's not even the average salary. That doesn't mean that people who are on that kind of a wage shouldn't be considered by politicians, that they shouldn't be helped by them. Of course they should. But to suggest that this is the issue that is consuming the country, 
I think, as I say, it just shows how out of touch he is. And for many people seeing that message as well, they would have thought, well, hang on, who's been in charge of childcare, mm -hmm. of what's happened with mm -hmm. mortgages over the last few years? It's been Conservative-led governments that have been in charge of this. So if anyone's mm. responsible for sorting this out, mm. I'm afraid it's Jeremy Hunt. Connor? As I said at the beginning, because I knew where this would go, um, if you take this individual comment to this individual constituent in isolation, it is perfectly easy then to portray the Conservative Party in its totality and the government in this way. Yeah, but it hasn't but been we, misinterpreted. But we are doing a huge <laughs> amount to, to raise the... The, the threshold at which people pay income tax, we're cutting the national insurance rate, mm -hmm. we're widening access to so-called free childcare. There is a huge amount that is being done, the universal credit change to incentivise and always make well, it me... better for people to be in work. Sure, there is a but, vast well, amount on. that is being done to support To those, correct, to correct to, the, the to mistakes or the difficulties that people... are in well, difficult let me, circumstances. Let me put it, I mean, just listening to this um, debate, Anthony, what does it say uh, about the UK that a government minister, a very senior one in the, in the Chancellor, admits that even the highest earners in the country, only around 3% earn £100,000 or more, are struggling. Struggling with housing costs, struggling with childcare. Well, taking it discussion in a slightly different direction, <laughs> as an educator, somebody who spent my life in schools and a bit of time in university, it, this is the first generation who will not have the standard of living of their parents. And what I look for for future governments, having spent so much of my time involved in well-being and action for happiness and other groups, is looking at the quality of life. And it's the quality of life, the quality of life in education, the helping young people learn about what good character is, how to use their time well, how to, 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 to lead a, a good and a meaningful life, which I think is really important, rather than endlessly banging on and looking at people on television and on social media who've got perfect bodies or perfect lifestyles. Of course, they haven't. Uh, of course, many of those people who are stinking rich are deeply unhappy, which is why they find the need to flaunt themselves all the time. So I want to look much more and hoping that whoever wins the next general election, it will be far more intelligent concern about the quality of life, what it means to be a human being, which is uh, under AI, what the big question is going to be about the next 20 years. Well, as you say, those are terribly important questions as a head they teacher, are, as a head teacher of a school. But there is one policy, a very pertinent policy, uh, that will have an impact on the parents of children mm. at schools uh, like Epsom College, which the Labour Party will introduce if they win the election, and that is VAT on private school fees. I mean, what impact will that have on parents and families? Uh, so I think Labour is absolutely right to want to get more money into state schools and to take state schools and education at large seriously. Uh, that's a great thing. Will this policy work? I don't know. I think the schools it's most likely to hit will be the independent schools that are really struggling, uh, those that are out of big urban conurbations, those that are operating on very tight margins. But I understand why they're doing it. Do you agree? It will affect small, small schools. Um, they'll have to close. And where will those pupils go? Well, ultimately, it is really important, as Anthony said, that we deal with a situation that impacts on nine out of every 10 children. And that is unfortunately simply not enough resource in the state system. We've had schools that are literally crumbling in our country. There aren't enough teachers. And it's really important that politicians are clear about how they're gonna face up to that. It would have been very easy to just pluck a figure out of the air and say, we'll raise that somehow. We're determined not to do that. We will set those plans out clearly. And we have said, yes, we'll remove that VAT exemption, business rates exemption, and put the money into those state schools. And please look, Annalise, at the fact that one third of young people are told that they are failures. They haven't done well enough at GCSE. Who is that one third of young people? They're disproportionately from less privileged backgrounds, from difficult homes, they've got learning difficulties, which is why they're not performing very well. Now, to tell already vulnerable people young people that they have failed after 11 years in formal education. It's not the children who failed, the young people, it's the system that has failed. We have an education system, as the Times Education Commission, uh, which we concluded last year, found we have an education system which is much better at finding what 
people cannot do than what young people can do. Each and every young person has their gifts and a good education system brings that out. How can they play a meaningful economic and social part in, in life? Let's talk about your book. It's called The Impossible Office, which question is mark. about the history... Question, question mark. mark is important. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We'll answer the question, maybe. Uh, which is about the history of the role of the Prime Minister. And over the last uh, 300 years or so, there have been 56 Prime Ministers. Rishi Sunak is the 57th. Before we discuss the book, let's just remind ourselves of the comings and goings over the last four and a quarter years from number 10. Thank you for the trust you have placed in us and in me, we will work round the clock to repay your trust and to deliver on your priorities with a parliament that works for you. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind invitation to form a new government. I look forward to spending more time in my constituency and continuing to serve South West Norfolk from the back benches. Some mistakes were made. And I have been elected as leader of my party and your Prime Minister, in part, to fix them. Anthony, three Prime Ministers since December 2019, and even talk, perhaps, of a fourth before the next general election. Has this period actually answered your question that it is an impossible job? Well, I think the way, Joe, that they choose to do it makes it impossible. I think the job is, is difficult, in some ways increasingly difficult, uh, because of uh, the tensions with the Chancellor, because of the impossible expectations that they themselves arouse of what a Prime Minister can do. But look, as the book says, there have been nine historic uh, Prime Ministers in history, and yes, they come from the Lib Dems, and they come from Labour, and they come from the Conservatives, so it's a splendidly fair <laughs> book. Uh, but these are people who are, oh, thank goodness for that, they, it, they are people who've really made history. They are people who have made the weather. Their successors, like with Margaret Thatcher the last, either try and be like them or uh, invite them into number 10 uh, uh, or they, they try to be not like them, but none can escape their shadow. They've left the country... Uh, in a stronger position, the union stronger. Well, what do you think, Annalise? How, how do you become a successful prime minister? Or has it become impossible? I, I don't think it is impossible. I think, and this may sound rather party political, but I think it is the reality now. I think it's impossible when you have a divided party. Mm. And that's what I think increasingly we've seen, that there's certain areas where our country really needs reform. I mean, planning reform, for example, um, what we're just talking about around kind of post-Brexit reforms, uh, housing delivery and so forth, where it's, it's just not possible with a divided party to have a prime minister who can lead in those circumstances. So, so I don't think it is impossible to be successful as a prime minister. But I, as I say, I don't think you can do it when you're spending all your time trying to manage a party that's very fractious and divided. I think that makes it very difficult. Connor? I don't think it's an impossible job. I think it's a job that is impossible for some people to do. Ah, which ones? And I think some <laughs> people who have got it have gone on to prove that in very short order. And do you include Boris Johnson and Liz Truss in that? I think post-Brexit, it's been extremely challenging. I think in different circumstances, Theresa May could have been a very long-term and successful stabilising Prime Minister. I think the, the machinery of government perhaps needed to respond to the way Boris works in a different way than a very conventional prime minister. The last one was an ocean-going chateau bottle disaster who was ill-equipped psychologically, politically and in every other way to do the role. She behaved as though she'd just won a Margaret Thatcher-esque 1983 mandate from the country where in fact she won a pretty small margin in a leadership election in an election that many in the Conservative Party regretted had happened almost as soon as it started. But the interesting thing, I, my degrees in history, I read all of Anthony's works, when you take young people around Parliament, you see all the statues and you go into members' lobby, mm. you know, there outside both doors are the four, Churchill and Lloyd George in wartime leaders in the 20th century, and then arguably the only two Prime Ministers who fundamentally set out not just to preside but to change the mm. country that they were governing, 
Clement Attlee in 1945 and Margaret Thatcher in 79. These weather-changing prime ministers are relatively rare events. Do you agree are, with that? No, no, go, go on, Andrew, you respond. Well, I've got to say, uh, building on what Annalise and Connor were saying, they are all nine of them there are moments of great historical import. So Connor there mentions uh, both the world wars, the welfare state, the enormous job for any prime minister after 1945 when Clement Attlee uh, came in. The, 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 it begs the question, Joe, are, do the great leaders, do great figures make history or does great history make great leaders? Do you need to know what you want to do with well, this? Well, that's another key thing. Yes. Uh, it's surprising how many prime ministers I mean, this was partly where Tony Blair, who who could have Roy Jenkins, thought that he was going to be the great prime minister. I mean, he fell short. I put him in the second tier along with Harold Wilson um, because, as he himself admits, when he had the most political capital, he didn't really get on and do the stuff. And then he got lost in Iraq and that damaged his standing and Britain's standing on the world stage. The great leaders either have their agenda thrust upon them or they come in with it. And that's uh, what the lesser figures uh, don't have. They don't create these opportunities. You've also got to have experience. You've got to be able to learn from history. I mean, Liz Truss uh, there, she worshipped Margaret Thatcher, but she didn't learn that Thatcher bided her time for two years, rolled the pitch, uh, made the contacts, uh, built the framework, mm. and then launched. Do you think Keir Starmer has a clear-sighted agenda does he know what he wants to do or has he communicated it well enough? I think that the country is crying out. It's 34 years. That's the longest gap for one of these since one of these iconic prime ministers have come along. Of course, it could be Rishi Sunak. I think, personally, Rishi Sunak is a better prime minister like John Major than contemporaries uh, see them as. Uh, but I think for Keir Starmer, look, he's like Clement Attlee. He's not... He's not charismatic, he's not a Boris Johnson, he's not a Tony Blair, but he's got that moral seriousness that, uh, that uh, the key, the great prime ministers have had. So yes, I think he could surprise it and do it. I think he would be better if he was a bit clearer about what he wanted to do, not least about yeah. Europe, Britain's position in the world, a bit more ambition, a bit more poetry, a bit more, um, bit more uh, magic out of him. Uh, but look, that's not him. He will. Clement Attlee was dull, 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 uh, much duller than than Starmer, and yet he he really did pull the rabbit out of the hat. Well, with, an extraordinary prime minister. Without being too flippant, um, it's been some time since the last Liberal uh, prime minister, about hundred years. Do you think there will be one any time soon? Who knows? Look, um, I think the fact of the matter is that leaders are shaped by both their vision for what they want to achieve, but also how they respond to events that happen. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is that Boris Johnson didn't respond well to the pandemic and Liz Truss didn't respond well to a cost of living crisis and Rishi Sunak has not responded well to um, both in international events and events at home. And so we've had three um, prime ministers that, that have failed. Fundamentally, what I think people want to see at the next general election are leaders who are serious, leaders who have a plan to fix the country because right now too many people feel as though everything is broken and they want leaders to say we can fix this we can be a great country again and this is the way that we can do it and I think above all they want to see an end to short-termism ah. now I think people are really sick of turning on the television an announcement one day forgotten about by the next week nothing happens nothing changes apart from unfortunately a lot of things getting worse and Keir Starmer did something that's quite different actually for an opposition leader when he said he's going to prioritise, he set out those five missions for government, they're long term, he's been really clear, nothing's going to be able to change overnight and also when we create that change it's going to have to be done in partnership with the whole country being involved. It's a very different style to what we've seen over recent years but I think it's quite frankly what the country is crying out for. That would be incredibly welcome if that was then met with engagement on things like long-term care and the health service, where we could get a national agreement oh. so that we don't have 24 hours to save the NHS, Tories privatising, dementia attacks, the big substantive things with agreement that we fix them. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you to all my guests. MPs are breaking up today and so are we, but I'll be back on Monday the 15th of April with more Politics Live to bring you here on BBC Two. But from all of us, have a great afternoon.